We're so pleased to welcome him here today. Thank you for that. Hey, normally I stand up and pontificate. Can I, can I chill and sit right here? Is that okay? Um, we have a lot to do in an hour. Um, uh, I'm going to, um, I move very fast. I'm going to initially bury you in a blizzard of images and maps and perspectives and then leave some time open um, uh, at the end for Q&A. Um, we are in an incredibly consequential period, and as a number of you, I've been working in variations of the Russian portfolio since 1980, when I joined the Army in the 1981, uh, started in a nuclear-capable artillery unit whose mission was to go and support the Fulda Gap. Uh, in the Cold War, and when it was over, and I tell young students that, you know, um, uh, we never want to go back to that, and here we are, and we don't want to go back to Dr. Strangelove and things like that. But um, uh, what I'm going to do is just do a quick overview. I'm going to give you a little bit of an origin story, how I came uh, into this, personalize it, and then we're going to get in, in the last half, into the details about what is going on in Ukraine, my view of it, and everybody will have a view and often different views. Um, a, a lot of lessons being learned and frankly unlearned right now and relearned, and, uh, and there is a revolution of military affairs that are going on that we're seeing right now, I think. Um, um, so um, I'm going to, without further ado, I'm going to touch on things that you already know, but I really believe, when and I will be doing this from a Russia perspective. I will touch on Ukraine, um, uh, and, um, um, and there, are, there is just, this is very much a, a, a easel that, that is still being painted, and nobody really knows what it's going to look like. Um, so uh, I'm honored uh, to be here. My is a, a undergrad. She did great here. And, she, and, um, um, and, and it's good to see her old dad gets to follow her in her footsteps. As I, as I tell everybody, though, I couldn't have gotten into Brown. My grades are so bad in high school. OK, here we go. Um, this is a mili mostly military analysis, but you can't do military without a, 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 a cultural and, if you will, um, geostrategic overview. Um, I always start, it doesn't matter, national, uh, whether it's National Security Council or a middle school student, I always have everybody just look at the map again, 11 time zones. Ca uh, ca much of it carved out of the hides of civilizations and, and, and nations and, and, and uh, 145 million people, plus or minus, it's one third. Of, uh, of the European Union's, 40% uh, of ours, and, and one ninth of China, and this. Um, um, and and I, I just, again, it's all you know this, but it, it, you know, when you get into the Russian worldview and their xenophobia and their contrived, if you will, existential threats, but that are also real if you go back to the Mongols and the Nazis, um, there's a lot going on. Okay, so, and the Arctic is melting, and that is opening up, and of course, they're playing a balancing game with China. I, this is this slide I always start and remind as we go into today, because if you look at it, and, you know, maybe analytically in a different way, you are a Russian, proud Russian. Not, you don't have to be a nationalist, just proud Russian. You wake up the day after Christmas, 1991, and you are now one of 15 nations. And, uh, and um, yeah, you, you'd support, uh, but that, it breaks up. Now, if you are an ethnic Russian in one of those 14 nations that wake up, excuse me, that wake up the day after Christmas, now they're a minority. And in some countries where they, they can't, you know, they, they, they can't stand them, it, it creates a, 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 a toxic potential stew. And this is of the era that, that uh, uh, Vladimir Putin evolved from Dresden, uh, East Germany, um, and then uh, up to through the 90s, we'll talk about and all. But I find this map so, in its simplicity, fascinating. But it just, boom, it breaks up. And what are you thinking? Slide. Oh, it's, I'm sorry. Okay. Me. 
<laughs> okay. Um, I, this is, uh, I'm, I'm a young Russian, um, uh, I'm an army captain, U.S. Army captain, the Russian Institute. We're in, this is, uh, we're in 1990 in Minsk, uh, and we're, our whole class is there. And we end up in the front of a May Day parade. We get disciplined a little bit for that. But it was that heady period where everything was changing and falling apart uh, in, in the Soviet Union. And, uh, and I was there both before and after, not during, um, the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the, the, the imagery of the, uh, of the scarlet, the Soviet flag going down and, and the white, blue, and red going up. I mean, oh my God, what a change. Slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. All right, uh, I'm, I'm a cold warrior. I come in to this world um, uh, of the, uh, where uh, uh, my first 10 years in the army, there was still in East Germany. Okay, there was still a Warsaw Pact. Um, and then you, and, and I will only remind that in 49, 89, and this gets very much at the narrative today, um, Yes, advance of socialism after the war, communism was also a buffer zone. It was also a buffer zone, it was control, and that starts to melt away, as we all know. Um, um, pink becomes uh, blue, and, and, and also becomes NATO uh, between, uh, uh, and I'm one that believes that NATO is righteous, um, uh, but, but uh, it's, it's a hard narrative with the Russians, as you know. And here we are. And the, 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 one, the one piece that I, uh, I like is you look at the East German border with West Germany, and then you draw a line above Estonia, Narva, up to St. Petersburg, Leningrad. It's about 800 miles. Um, and, um, and, then, uh, and now today, with NATO enlargement, Narva is about 80 miles from the... Uh, from the uh, uh, from St. Petersburg suburbs, and, and if you're a, a Russian of the, you know, the Westphalian world and looking at the world of blue and you, this looks very ominous if you want to spin it. Slide. <laughs> so sorry. Um, all right, two minutes uh, on my origin story um, in Russia, um, maybe three. I get tapped with a couple of other of those, um, of those young uh, army uh, uh, attaches and being, uh, foreign area officers, um, and I, um, I get a visa from the Soviets to go with an American college group, and Brown University was part of it, was Brown University, University of Rochester, to a provincial city called Kalinin, now called Tver. It was renamed uh, with all the name changes on the Volga River um, between um, Moscow and St. Petersburg. Uh, and and it, was, uh, it was old traditional city. Uh, Catherine the Great had her Putovoy Palace there, her travel palace, but really organic Russia. Slide. And I spend a summer, I spend uh, two months there and then uh, another part of a month traveling with the group. And we're really out there among the Russians. And we're treated a little combination between a being like Martians and rock stars uh, as an American college group. And those of you who have been in that would understand. Uh, one thing to go to Moscow, St. Petersburg, or Leningrad, which is already amazing, but to go out there, you really were odd, in a, in, not in a bad way. Amazing curiosity. And, and there, I'm standing there, kind of not believing it, in front of the old bridge on the Volga. Uh, which we swam across, D you know. <laughs> slide, slide, please. And it, it, you get an idea. I, I mean, and, and I'm encountering Russian military. I'm with some young Russian uh, officers and getting completely bombed. Uh, I've got a Russian major's hat in my head. And uh, I get adopted by a group of uh, young soldiers and take a picture in front of one of the fortresses. There's the Volga, and there is our part of our college group with some of the Russians, and we've just spent three days finding the ingredients to make a pizza. <laughs> to just to get how lines, ultraviolet, all of that was still there. Slide. I then in 1990, I come back. The, the key point is I come back to this town eight more times between 89 and 99. 
Um, and, and, uh, and that becomes my window through these people into, if you will, into the, into the soul of, of street light Russia. Not politicos, not just you know, I, college friends, professors, black marketeers, um, um, uh, you, you know, families, whole thing. And the number of you that were in Russia at that time, it's Wild West. Uh, so, uh, and at this time in 91, we get emboldened. I come back in um, and with a friend of mine, some of you may have seen him uh, on, on the news uh, long ago, Ralph Peters. We fly to Moscow and it shows in the, uh, how crazy and open it was. We fly from Frankfurt, go to Moscow. We've gotten an inter's a visa through. We rent this uh, Alada and we drive in the summer of 91 two army captains with, with American passports all the way down to Sochi via the Gruzinski Voenichasa over the Georgian military and Tbilisi and down. And we're seeing how Russia, the Soviet Union is creaking and beginning to fall apart. <laughs> it was actually amazingly reliable. They did not rent you the same car. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is a full up lotto, not a gigolet. But, but, but it was, a, it was a, and we got pulled over because you had a, different plates on them. Um, we got pulled over by Milizia like 20 times. Uh, and they didn't know what to do with us. We're Americans, we're American, American, we're out somewhere in the Donbass or, or something, I mean the route. And we go right through these uh, areas in the news, and, and almost 3,000 miles. But that's the origin story why, I do, uh, why I'm into this. I go back to the town eight more times, slide please, and, and I write uh, the book about this period, and I finally put, slapped together all the diaries and notes that I'd done uh, last fall, put a forward and an afterward to bring it to the current, uh, and it's all about life on the streets and maybe useful as a perspective, slide please. Uh, then, here's the insane thing. I'm a young army captain at that time, thinking maybe I'll get to major. I don't know. 25 years later, I get promoted to brigadier general. That wasn't the plan. I joined the army for three years and screwed up and stayed for 34. And, and, but I find myself in Moscow just eight, nine years ago as our defense attache at a really consequential time, not quite as this, but it was already getting pretty crazy. And whether it's the diplomacy, my bride and I, there's a whole international community, and also with the Russians, because when you're in that diplomatic world, it's almost a kabuki dance. It's, it's, a, it's a completely different environment. Um, you could be the, you know, you could be short of World War III, and there's still the, the emotions of diplomacy, diplomatic community, and got out. And, we're in Stalingrad in, in 2013 for the 70th anniversary. Who's that? That's Alexander Vindman. And uh, he worked for me, and we're with a, uh, we're with a Soviet veteran of, of Stalingrad with all his orders of Slava and everything else. It was just one of those this, it's sort of surreal moments in Russia, but this kind of builds, and I give you this because this, uh, this gives you a sense of the military a little bit and will give more context why I'm doing stuff like this still. Um, I will be clear, I want to be clear right up front. Uh, I think that the regime is monstrous and, and, and needs to go out in the pages of history. Saying that, I fundamentally like the Russian people and appreciate their culture. So I, I am always in a balancing struggle in my own head. Um, uh, and I'm very, and, and the sentiment I feel about Ukraine right now is anger. It's an anger that this thing is going on. More on that later slide. And, and uh, this is some of the things, you know, we're meeting with Russian generals at the Frunze Academy, and some of you may see General Hurtling uh, from, uh, that you see on CNN now. Well, he was the commander of U.S. Army Europe, and I brought him in to, to, uh, as his escort to meet his Russian counterpart, and that was October of 2012. So as late as 12, even 13, and Mike Flynn came in on 13, 
And I know, but, it, but he met the director of the GRU at that time. I mean, so there was stuff going on. When the news is squawking about intelligence exchanges and information passed, that happens. Even we did at one time with the Russians, um, and especially in the counter-terror stuff even recently. So, but that gives a sense of, of some of the environment slide. All right, now we're going to move more and more to Ukraine. Just, you look at the, uh, the map, just look where it is. You've seen this a thousand times. As Putin would say, if Ukraine goes west, Belarus, there's nothing left to defend between there and Moscow. Some of you have read that. But that's that old Barbarossa mentality. But they did have Barbarossa happen. 20 to 26 million of them, a good chunk Russian, but also Ukrainians, Belarusians, uh, Moldovans died in that horrible invasion. And, and while there are aspects of the Soviets that certainly precipitated it, um, the bottom line, half of the people that died were innocent civilians that were, were caught up in it. Uh, but this is, you know, uh, this is a uh, key slide. I love this cartoon because uh, this is sort of the time when I was there in 14, 15, and I do believe there's an aspect of that the, where, where you've seen the dominoes of, of, of all these countries falling into NATO and in Putin's, if you will, if you will, blinkered worldview. Um, um, this is, the, he, he, the, the, it's got to stop at Ukraine. And I believe that 14 was as much preemptive and reactive as it was, and it was aggressive. But, uh, but that was the environment. A slide, please. And we know, and this is where the first campaign ends, in the blue. And then the light, the, the, the medium orange color, to remind, is the rest of the Donbass, is the rest of eastern Ukraine. And a lot of that is still in play. Most of Luhansk is gone. Good chunks of Donetsk remain Ukrainian. Um, and this is going to be, um, and I think that the, many of us thought that the Russian goals um, in, in, in February, so 10 weeks ago, thought that it was going to be to try to grab just the rest of uh, Donbass and, and maybe push down to the Crimea, but I think many of us were almost dumbfounded that they would, with the force structure they had, to try to go after uh, Kiev and everything east of the Dnieper, or maybe even more, but we'll talk more about that. Uh, slide, please. And just to remind you know that this is how it looked um, in, in 14 to us in Moscow, where in, in ugly fighting, they, they, you know, they end up Luhansk, Lunetsk, and of course Crimea. And the, the tragic thing in my mind on Crimea, or maybe the realists thing, I think that the Russians and the Ukrainians, not now, it's too bitter and too vicious right now, there would have been or may be some type of negotiation room regarding the Donbass. I think the Russians will go to full out, all out war over Crimea. I, I, uh, and, um, you know, um, and, and we, can, we'll, we can get into that. Um, um, but to be in Moscow in the embassy and see the little green, no, not know what was going on and getting reports and everything. Who are they there? Those are Russian weapons, they're massive. It was crazy, and, and, and the takedown of Ukraine, of, 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 uh, of, of uh, Crimea was rather impressively done. Uh, Donbass was ugly and clumsy, um, and, and we were through that, but it sets the scene for everything else that's going on now. Slide. I'm, I come back now. And Lyle knows this. I come back to Moscow, and I'm now bringing it to the now. I get invited to speak at the Moscow Security Conference as a private American citizen. Um, of course, our State Department and, 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 and NSC knew, because uh, as a retired general, I would never go in there on my own independently and say things without our side knowing. Uh, but I go in, but just gives you the scar tissue of the mood 10 months ago. I arrive, there's the White House. Flag is a hat fast. Oh, why? What? I just wanted to go back to the, the statement about the clumsy and ugly in the Donbass today. Because there's some line that, you know, they were just intervening in what was a civil war already. And I'm just 
I am. Um, uh, the ugly, clumsy part, and, and well, I'll try to hold it to the end or I'll never get there, no, um, is it's all of that and, and the narrative in Moscow and Russian news and Pervy Canal and 24 and all of that was, oh, the, you know, it was, it was, it was you know, death and dying of, of, of ethnic Russian mothers and children in the Donbass and Nazis and, uh, and they're still playing that and, um, oh no, it's all of that. Uh, the bottom line is, is that they, they went cross-border, uh, they had their narrative, they had their justification, and they did it, and they never admitted that they had active duty troops in there, right, right up till now. They've never really, well, it's a little different since the beginning of February, but uh, long, we, we can get into this. There's a side of the Russians, I think, and you would know better than I, they feel that they get talked down to as school kids. Uh, there, is a, there is a sense, there's an aspect of lack of respect and things like that that, in, that I think plays out in the narrative and dialogue. And uh, uh, the Russians will play international law, or they'll play their Duma law like they did with Luhansk and Donetsk right before the invasion, they'll spin law, um, um, whether real or contrived, to suit their purposes. Uh, but yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure Putin was listening to um, um, Obama and probably just in his mind, yada, 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 you know, and just chaff. There, he was determined, he didn't care, would be my, my answer, I view. They were on a course like they were in the, like they were in February, March, April. Now we're we'll be curious to see what that course is going to be. Um, and there was nothing that was going to talk them out of it. Um, and I think part of it, now that we're on to Putin, is I think that uh, part of it is his own inner mindset, his psyche, what he believes. As we saw, uh, dictators, he's an evolving or evolved dictator. Um, wasn't completely that early on. And, um, 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 and basically, uh, I think the, the word I use for Putin, and I will come back to it, is I, I, I think that in his own calculus, he's cold-bloodedly rational. But he has lost his moorings, in my mind. He's lost his perspective. And I, I, uh, um, I, uh, I, I find him about Ukraine and Russia's place in the world and where it's placed in the world. I find him clinically obsessed, would be the term that I would use, um, um, I, you know, as far as to try to describe a state of mind. But you come in here, and, and this, is, this is a big deal. This is the great, great patriotic war. And uh, there were ceremonies there. Um, the, the conference, I went in there, and I'm carrying with me in his vestia in Pravda, which I picked off of a, picked up on a Russian Soviet street in the summer of 1991 on that epic car drive, and I brought it to me, and it was part of what I showed the Russians there to say I've been here before, okay, and there they are. So uh, big deal, and it plays I think into the narrative that we're going to see in Victory Day just in a few days. Slide, please. And here they were; they, they were all speaking there. Uh, um, uh, there's a, Putin was teleconference, but, but Shoigu was there, Gerasimov, uh, Patrushev, Lavrov, Bortnikov, and Rushkin were all there giving addresses. There were 45 nations. And I'm in the corner in the back saying, pinching, I can't believe I'm here. Slide. And here are the foreigners that were there, okay? Um, uh, you had, uh, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, Deputy Minister of Defense, China. You had Revolutionary Guards, Venezuela, uh, cars at Nicaragua, um, uh, Myanmar gave an address. Um, so it was, it was a real but. Uh, you know, I'm just sitting there. I've been to one of these before as an attache, and you're wincing because it's, it's really anti-American and really anti-Western. 
and, and there are a lot of the mini nations that are all kind of on board, slide. And of course, and we all, but we don't have time to get into it, this is when the beginnings of almost, almost um, demands about NATO back to the 1997 line, I mean, and completely unrealistic, but it starts, and I, I don't want to get into it right now, but we all live NATO, but there it is in the orange or the yellow. And again, from a, from a Westphalian perspective, um, uh, this is very hard for, for a lot of Russians. They spin it, they contrive it, because NATO has tried to work better relations. And I try to remind, and I did it in my speech, hey, these countries wanted to be in NATO. They want to be in NATO. It wasn't that way in the Warsaw Pact. And, 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 and finally, do you really think Russia would be in a world 20 years ago, 20 years from now, safer in a world without NATO or stability in Europe? Okay, uh, but that, that was a big, that was in the office. Here's a, here's a slide that will be interesting. Next, please. Is uh, just a few quotes and quips in red. Right up, right there in red, um, Patrushev, situation in Europe, explosive. Now there's some of us in the crowd, God, that's, that's, I mean, we've heard that, but that's kind of aggressive and hyperbole. And, uh, and then uh, how long will Russia be able to resist NATO hybrid expansion? Um, um, U.S. occupation regime in Europe since Yalta in 95. And so, I mean, these are tropes we've all heard before, but it's really interesting when you're seeing, you know, these people, Lavrov and all these guys, basically saying variations of it. Um, um, you know, lines increasingly blurred between conventional and uh, nuclear. We're kind of in that space now. Um, um, so, but I just wanted to throw that up. It was a really fast, and just to sit there and listen. Slide, please. And at this time, you know, they've started their big military exercises. It didn't just start in February. It, they, they were running exercises last, last spring and last summer. Uh, it's kind of a wind-up. And I just kind of, kind of, you kind of like this slide, just before the invasion. You know, we're, we're trying still to negotiate and work and, you know, and parry. And, and, and it looks like Putin and the Russians, they were very, very direct. And I think a lot of us were, frankly, right up to the day of invasion, all the indicators were there that they were going to do it. But a lot of us just can't believe they're going to do it. Because just the, the, the monstrousness of it, we didn't grow up in the 30s and 40s. Um, so, slide. And there it is. There's the invasion. And it begins in its... It uh, you know, begins with a rain of cruise missiles and, and, and fires, and nobody is exactly knowing what's going on. Um, um, it, 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 some of us thought it was a little bit sporadic in the way they were doing it, thinking that maybe this is like you know, our shock and awe with Iraq. They were just going to shock and awe the Ukrainians. And boy, did they get that one wrong. And uh, because they were just at this point, just, you know, so slide. And we're just going to talk about the, uh, the invasion. You've all been watching this on whether CNN, MSNBC, you know, even Fox, um, and the other, other channels. I sometimes will go out on uh, Al Jazeera or France 24, uh, and get out in some of the other stations where, where um, um, they're not editorial stations like our own. Um, but, but here it is. This is... This is, we remember this. This is uh, March 28th. Um, this is a, a, you know, a month now um, afterward. And we really, you know, the Kiva survived. But that's what it looked like. The Russians were all over. This is before they fell back. This is before we really knew what was going on in Bucha. It was really, really scary. The issue was more how long do they hang on? Most of us thought the Kiev would be gone in four to seven days. Um, and then, the, it's almost a miracle when you see it on a map, April 6th, this is the blue. This is when the Russian forces are melting down outside of Kyiv. And the Ukrainians are getting around and pushing. And, and this is a rather dramatic victory. Um, because I, all, everybody, everybody 
thought that, uh, that, uh, that the Russians um, would ultimately, it would be ugly, uh, at, at least take Kyiv, whether they held it, another story. And, but here was the rest of Russia, uh, the rest of, and, and there have been considerable gains here. But it gives you an idea of where we were just six weeks ago. Um, so what is going on as well? A slide, please. And this is, I call it an initial military disaster for the Kremlin, because this is far from over, okay? Um, and first phase, in my mind, is, is, was, was the beat back of Kyiv. We're deep into a second phase where the Russians are actually foundering as well, as we're seeing unexpectedly. Uh, and look what's going on. The, 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 the Moskva, a Slava class, Elite cruiser, flagship, the is sunk. Oh my God! You know that's kind of the 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 2022 equivalent of you know the Russian flagship going down at Shushima, 1905. And of course we've read about how the Russian armor and materiel is just getting chopped up in the long logistics convoys, and 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 the and nobody 10, 11 Russian generals killed. And, 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 and uh, I got asked about this just yesterday, because I get asked to speak sometime. I don't like getting into issues of intelligence and uh, providing information. There are exchanges all over the world. That really is the type of thing that officials should not be talking about. Um, uh, because A, it is, it is important um, intelligence, but it is also incendiary. And that feeds now into the Russian mind, oh, the Americans are targeting generals, specifically assassinated. So, so I was very uncomfortable with that line of question, but the, the media just jumped on it. I mean, it was, it was feeding frenzy. And the Russians, so at sea, on land, and they're in, in the aviation. They, 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 they have not, while well, they've got air superiority, sort of, they don't have dominance. And they go low, and they're having problems with stingers and all that. So this, in the aggregate, this has been a mess, in part because the Russians have not been able to well coordinate this, that, and that. And because of that, they've had to send these guys up front for whatever reason, and they've been getting killed. So slide, please. And here we are, May 3rd, just now. And, and again, Kiev is... is, is, is Stable's probably the wrong, wrong word. And now you're reading about possible pushbacks up in the Kharkiv area. Um, and Kharkiv is fascinating. It's four time, uh, it was four major battles for Kharkiv. It was seized, retaken uh, four times in, in World War II. And, uh, and then uh, the, the, they have, they're holding in Donetsk. Uh, and we thought we were worried about Russian pincers pincers coming up from the north of the, and trying to encircle, if you will, the cream, if you will, of the Ukrainian army, which is still, uh, you know, on lines, almost World War I positions, like, like Verdun, you know, uh, um, against that. But the, these, these pincers have been held, and there has been this worrisome push down uh, toward Kherson, uh, toward Odessa that slowed down as well. Um, and then, of course, there's Crimea. Now, uh, military historian, slide. What's that? That's the Battle of? Kursk. Kursk. What happens at Kursk, just 100 miles to the north, the Kharkiv? Um, the uh, Nazis in 1943 tried to pincer this, this gigantic salient that the Soviets have, and the cream of the German armored forces gutted. Uh, on this in a, in a, in a 10 day to two week fight. And so while the fight in the Donbass is smaller in scale, there's a sort of an interesting historical symmetry. Pincer battles, uh, the attackers, everybody think are gonna win, but they're not winning. Um, and this was the beginning, uh, this is the beginning of the end for the Third Reich, this, this victory uh, by the Soviet slide. Peter, I wanna leave yeah. time for questions. So okay, 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 mind. okay. Um, and here we go, we're almost at the end. And here we go, um, um, uh, we're worried about the South, epic Mariupol, epic Mariupol. I worry that it is gonna fall by, uh, they want it by the 9th of, of uh, they want it by the 9th of May, okay? They want it by the 9th of May. I think they're gonna see brutal assaults now 
and it looks like, you know, the defenders are barely hanging on, but they're hanging on. Slide. Slide. Now, go back, please, for a second. Just look at this swath of red. Now, go to this slide. Novaya Russia. All right? New Russia. It's Catherine the Great, 1800s, aspirational. I don't think they're going to get there, but it all goes all the way down to Moldova and Bessarabia. Uh, um, so, I just throw that up. Slide. Cruel months ahead. Uh, Victory Day, um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be more reinforcements. A lot of young people are being killed, including run, young Russian soldiers. How that plays back, and how is Putin going to deal with this in the narrative? Uh, slide. And they, what's going on with the Ministry of Defense, uh, the uh, MOD chief uh, Shoigu and Gerasimov? It's not going well for them. They brought in a new general to get all this thing sewn together. Uh, about three weeks ago, but hasn't yet worked because it takes more than a few weeks to organize or reorganize months. But they're 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 desperate. I think uh, on their timeline slide, uh, evening the odds. We don't need to talk it. We know about it. This this major influx of stuff from the West is is dramatic uh, for Ukraine. People will say it's not enough, but um, um, and it could, could become really critical if. What I fear is that the Russians uh, try to portray humanitarian and, and, and uh, call for ceasefire and a freezing of the lines and negotiations along the lines where they are now, which would force the Ukrainians to attack, uh, or else they do lose a lot of us. Why do you fear that? What? Why do you fear that? I, I, I fear that for the Ukrainians. I, I, don't, I want the war to end for the Ukrainians. But if the Russians end up with hundreds and hundreds of square miles of occupied terrain, it will be almost impossible to get them off of it. Um, uh, it'll be like a new 2014 uh, Minsk line. And, and I think the Ukrainians need to every chance to get back at least their, 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 their territory from 23 um, February. Uh, slide. Uh, epic strategic miscalculation for the Russians. Um, <laughs> NATO, that's Finland also and Sweden. Um, um, what is now Ukraine and, and the EU and, and Russia? Um, weapons coming in on rail and all that, even despite the Russian strikes. And this is actually very important, Russian, uh, Ukrainian military. This is a group of non-commissioned officers Meaning, meaning at the mid-level, low-level unit level. For the last, last decade or more, we and our European allies have been tra a training initiative in the Ukrainian forces life. Um, a generation loss? Is this become so vicious now that uh, can there be reconciliation in the near term? Can there be uh, with the buchas and, 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 and all of that? Um, uh, and this is going to be something to watch. Um, what are the war crimes? I mean, there's a, so much baggage um, uh, out there with this if we are able to get to a ceasefire negotiation. And uh, so I throw that out, slide. Um, the Putin and the regime, what happens? We don't know. Um, but it is in my mind for the regime now all about regime perpetuation. And um, if they feel they're going down, if Putin feels he's going down, anything is possible. I just don't know. Slide. Um, the whole China-Russia thing, can you believe exactly just three months ago they were meeting in Beijing before the Olympics? Can you imagine the conversation they had? I think Xi Jinping probably said, oh, it was told, didn't give him details, and said, all right, just not, not until our Olympics end, and don't get into trouble. And, uh, uh, and he's gotten into a lot of trouble, and this, I think, makes the future in what China's aspirations a whole lot harder in Asia right now. Because their, their partner, doesn't mean military, his guy has kind of gone wobbly. So I, uh, we're at the end, uh, and I can only touch on it because I don't know whether it's chemical or low-level tactical. I'd still say it's unlikely, but increasingly possible. Russia is out there thumping its chest, and all these new nuclear technologies are out there. 
And it's only a half joke about Dr. Strangelove. It's, it's, it's that crazy, the stuff they're strutting out. And it's real. Slide. And when in doubt, when in doubt, then you see you, EU, EU, NATO, and even us kind of, oh, you know, or else I think this would have been over a long time ago. Uh, slide. Uh, I encourage you to, uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, partake in these books. I think you'll find them uh, interesting. And um, um, with that, uh, I'll stop. OK, wonderful, uh, General. Thank you so much. Uh, terrific uh, summary of the situation. I, I, um, we only have really 15 minutes here, so, and I think uh, we'll see if, if uh, the general can stick around a little bit. I'll be here, I'll be here for you. But um, let me, let's do something unorthodox here and uh, so we can get a lot of questions out. We'll spend the next five minutes just going around. People, if they can very briefly uh, uh, level their question and then, and then Peter can take the last 10 minutes and try to answer some of those. So I'll uh, pitch mine quickly, is, is about the bridges over the Dnieper. Uh, why haven't the Russians just dropped them? Don't answer, don't answer. Let's uh, go straight to Tony and then to Mike. Yeah. I'll track the questions, by the way. Okay, Anna. So yeah. I guess you have my questions, but I, I think my main question is uh, what. I'm writing these down, by the way. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. I'm keeping track of these. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Grant's been doing a lot of work on the Belt and Road Initiative and looking at the map of Europe and the 16 plus 1 and the 17 plus 1. It's very much like your maps. And so I wonder what is China's role in these countries? What What's going, how is this going to affect their ideas for what they hope to achieve yeah. diplomatically, economically, financially? Uh, unfortunately, four hours ago, before I, I, I was polishing, I took out a slide of both the Belt and Road Initiative and the Polar oh, Initiative. Okay, hold on, hold on. Okay. Hold on. Michael, yeah. Uh, Tony's question reinforced, but also, does your worry about escalation today yes. look, the, look, no, look the same as your worry about escalation one month ago? Uh, great okay. question. Yeah. Adam, uh, Grant. Okay, uh, this is a uh, Moldova question. And, uh, <clears throat> from the public, there's not that many troops that uh, Russia has in Transnistria, but as a military analyst, uh, what, what, how do you see them potentially going forward? Okay. Sir? Yes, uh, General, if you were a mole in the Kremlin and Putin asked you to write his May 9th victory speech, <laughs> what would it look like to defuse the situation? Yeah. Awesome. Okay. okay. Yeah, <laughs> sir. Thanks. Uh, so, on your slide about the Russian military disaster, it seemed like you were describing pretty classic um, issues with coordinating between domains, combined arms, covering concealment, and providing suppressive fire. So, I want to push you. If that's true, then how is this a revolution in military affairs? Like, All right. Okay. Okay. I got it. I got it. Sure. 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 Uh, yes. Given the election results in Belarus, uh, is there any possibility of a popular uprising there taking advantage of yeah, the situation? Yeah, it's a great question. Oh, very good. Okay, maybe um, a, a final question, uh, sir? Yeah. I was going to say, we've heard talk of the chances of Russian mobilization, and I was wondering how likely yeah. Okay, I think okay. that was 10 questions. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll remind uh, you. Three minute, I'll do three minutes apiece, and we'll walk out at quarter six. Okay. Um, <laughs> Ready yet set? Ready yet set. And I have to, I have to um, throttle my desire to expand on things. But uh, 
repeat yours again now. Uh, we'll start with yours. Sure. We've heard talk of the possibility of a Russian general mobilization. Yeah. Right. The, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. The um, a. I think, frankly, nobody really knows for sure. Uh, I mean, Russia has a large uh, pool of former military. I mean, you know, I mean, they have conscription. They've served, you know, older ones. Uh, getting old from the Soviet period. And so the estimate is around a two million person manpower pool that has not been tapped. Um, and a declaration of war, and I don't know the details through the sort of tortured Russian legislative process in Duma, would in theory allow them in a state of war to release those reserves and also allow conscripts, draftees, to serve abroad, which they've been doing anyway. Um, um, and it puts a legal patina on an all-out potential mobilization. Um, um, and then also it is a, you know, this, this puts even more state control in the industry, the war industry. It, it comes down to how far they want to go, how far does Putin want to take it, Getting at a prior question on, on May 9th, and, and there is speculation that they'll announce it there, there are two parades. A number of you would know this. There's the famous May 9 Victory Day Parade. Um, but I stood and saw another one when I was in Moscow, and it's the 7 November drive through Red Square of all the old Soviet stuff. And Stalin, sat up there on Lenin's tomb, or stood up there, as Soviet forces uh, coming from Siberia and elsewhere were coming in on rail, detraining and marching through Red Square, and then going to fight the Wehrmacht, the Nazis just 70 miles away. That's a call to arms, that's an existential moment, that, and I think somewhere in nine it may, if, and, and maybe I'm being excessively colorful, Putin is going to try to appeal to the, the roots and ruts of what Stalin did after all his misactions of the 30s. You know, basically, Mother Russia, we have to pull together. This is existential. Um, and then somewhere would be part of the Nine May narrative. Um, I'm exaggerating a bit, I know, but I think this, the difference between 9 May last year and this year is, is what's going on in Ukraine, in Ukraine, existential for the regime? And you wanna, you wanna try that uh, question about this revolution in military affairs? Yeah, RMA, I'm, I'm only saying is, is that there are things going on, um, there are, Classic, you, you know, um, uh, you know, technologies, if you will, applications, deployments, uh, tanks, artillery, infantry, all of that air power, and there seems to be the 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 we're beginning to see, and we saw it in Armenia and Azerbaijan, and we've seen it in other places where there are new technologies now that it's like the battleship being canceled, if you will. Um, um, do, do you think the days of the tank are, are the days of the tank? There will always be um, there will always be um, room for a heavily armored uh, 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 system, but when the infantry now can take out a, a reasonably well armored tank at, 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 at you know two or three thousand yards. I mean, and catastrophically destroy it. And we're seeing this, M1s have been knocked out by Houthis in, 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 uh, in Yemen and from the, the, the Saudi. So things are changing. Drones, Bayaktar TB1 and TB2 drones and, and, and all of that. And, and, uh, um, uh, and, and, um, the, and a new, if you will, sophistication in uh, radio electronic combat, which by the way, the Russians have not shown. And we were all very surprised on that. So my son is a young officer in artillery right now in the US Army. 
And they now have to, they're trained, they're looking for drones and things like that. You can't hide behind a hill like you used to. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, some of these geopolitical questions like uh, Moldova, Belarus, the Belt and Road, do you want to comment on some of those? Yeah, Belt and Road uh, is, um, um, I've always believed that the Belt and Road, that for the Russians it's a dual edged sword. The Russians are on board with the Belt and Road Initiative because they have to be. Because they have no way really to say no to China to do it. Do you think the Russians really like uh, tendrils of Ru Chinese influence and, 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 and business, which means they need security uh, and infrastructure going through what I call the former the former, uh, the former independent, the former southern independent lands of the Soviet Union. Okay, uh, that's a mouthful. But, but, but so that that I think Belt and Road thing is important. And then you have the Polar Silk Road. Now the, the Russians are on board; they're going to make some money on it. But you can't believe if you're sitting in Moscow as a general staff officer. And yeah, we've got our we're, we've got our dalliances. If you really like seeing a lot of Chinese influence going to your south, and you see them now building icebreakers and looking uh, for more influence in the north. That would be my simple question. But they're on board with it right now because they have to be. What about Belarus and Moldova? Belarus and Moldova. Um, I, was, uh, I think that uh, if there's anything we know about Lukashenko, he smells tea leaves and he's a survivor. And uh, he needed Putin to bail him out um, in 2020. A lot of, lot of Belarusian youth uh, on the streets. 16, 17, 20-year-olds. Well, the Belarusian army is about 50% conscript, draftee. And a lot of those people that are out there at Tikhanovskaya in 2020 are probably in the Belarusian army now. And I think that, that, that for, for the Russians and Putin, I think that they have taken an appetite suppressant, and they probably sense um, that if the Belarusian military were to come in in a major way across the border into also Slavic brother Ukraine, that they could melt down. And then that meltdown would extend into Belarus, and this time Russia couldn't bail them out. So, so if, as Ukraine goes in many ways, it's a great question, I think goes Belarus. It might just take longer. Yeah. So, so I think that there, the, 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 and you've been reading about, you know, the, the sabotage and things that are going on in there. Okay, we have three minutes. For you three, are an incredible moderator. Uh, we have um, the question about the counteroffensive. Yes, so Kharkiv. Uh, is, we have an infrastructure and bridges question and also this all-important question of escalation. Uh, are we in a very yeah. dangerous spot, more dangerous than we were a month ago. Am I doing okay? Am I sane? I mean, mm -hmm. you got to top. You got to stop me if I if, because I always get worried. I get on a hobby horse. No, you're doing great, but we will we'll try to end on time. The um, well, okay. <laughs> no, you, you're doing great. Where um, uh, first one again uh, was the um, the counteroffensive. Counteroffensive. I can put the map. Back put, up. Go back up to the blue areas where Kiev is. You know, a map. Yeah, uh, go, uh, yeah that's great. We'll just do it this way. The Russian forces essentially melted down up there. Uh, you had a lot of young conscripts, and they didn't know what the hell was going on. Now that, and, and the Ukrainians, they own the ground, they own the night, they own the villages. And those big blue and big red things aren't full of Russian forces and occupied. They're basically out there on the lines, and then you have supply lines. You have Rosgvardia out there doing things and, and, and various militias and all that. But, but th th this started to melt down. They couldn't keep it all supplied because we think of tanks and all this heavy stuff. But think about the hundreds of thousands of trucks thin-skinned trucks and jeeps that have to keep them supplied. 
that are driven probably not by your elite troops, were scared out of their mind, they're getting sniped at, this epic, you know, 80 mile or 40 mile convoy that was stopped for what, two, two weeks? Now imagine you're a Russian soldier, conscript, with your, and you're sitting in there freezing to death in there, you run your vehicle gas out, your heater doesn't work, you, you, don't, oh, you can't sleep in a village, you're sleep. So you had all that there. I think Kharkiv um, in this area here, uh, Russians can't be strong everywhere. And I think that as close, and it's remarkable, Kharkiv is held so close to the Russian border. But it is 1.3, it is the second largest city in Ukraine. And this will be a mother for the Russians to actually take down. They've concentrated here and here. And they don't have forces for everything. And, 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 and so I think that the Ukrainians, because they own the ground and have a sense of where the Russians are and aren't, um, they're, they're, they're coming in and pushing them around and hitting them on the flanks. So I think that's what's happening with the counteroffensive. Okay. But just to connect the two questions. Please. Why not just do Grozny in Kharkiv? What is restraining the I, you know, I, I, it's almost a gutter Damron question. Uh, and um, they still, in their own, as they say, blinkered view, still need to sell a narrative to the less aligned world and their own people. Uh, as, as hard as it is. And, and, you know, the word is sluhi uh, in Russian. It's a great word. Rumors. The rumors are out right now. And the, and the words of the young, young, young folks being killed or disappearing never come. It's out. And so the Russians are fighting a, a very hard rearguard action on information. Uh, um, to completely rubble Kiev. Um, maybe from a blink. I mean, Kharkiv, excuse me. Um, it, it could <laughs> still happen. And I was thinking Kiev, that's a big difference. Um, um, and, and you get another Stalingrad, and I think it, it, just, it just gets uglier. The Russian forces aren't willing to impale their forces uh, in these big cities anymore. And we'll, and, uh, and we'll see what ha I, I, I I fear from Mariupol that eventually can't take it anymore, but, but these are bloody fights also for the attackers. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you, General. Yeah, this is great.